William R. Quinn, Q-U-I-N-N, 1721, I think it's Drive, Pasadena. Can you tell us anything right now? Just uh, older white male and... That's it. You can tell me more. Where's he from? Can't tell you that. I can't tell you that I looked in a car that has California plates on it. Okay. When can I get an interview? It says we find something out. They're going to have a picture of you and I sitting in this truck outside of Motel 6. That ought to make some headlines. <laughs> Don't worry, my okay, wife never watches TV. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, first name Leon, L-E-O-N. No middle name. He'll be at 715 of 70. Also to contact him, lead there. Okay, we'll do. Uh, go to 12 flight 4. On a good 10 second. We don't know who he is. Uh, fill me in. At this time, we are in the process of conducting an autopsy. We have what we feel is a good identification. However, we'll withhold that until we make notification, and it appears he died from a gunshot wound to the head. Is there anything else you would like to add? No. Bonk. I don't have anything else to add. You make, my, hole in your pocket. There you go. You make my job. Was it out? You, yeah, you had poked a hole in your pocket. I did. <laughs> That's all right. We don't want the department to find out about that, okay? Um, no family's been notified yet? Nothing. I haven't been able to get away from here yet. Well, you better get going, okay? <laughs> I'm going to call you back. Okay, yeah. I, I'm going to go Why in. Not more? I'm going to call where he lives and have them take care of it. Okay, and then tell me more. I'll give you a call. Better. All I can tell you right now is we received a call that there was a possible suicide at the Motel 6 Motel. Motel doesn't have a restaurant and bar. You just come to the motel, park your car, sleep, and then go away. Keep traveling. There's no room service. There's no valet parking. The carpet doesn't match the drapes. It's you know, it's like camping sort of. Actually, there's not much difference between the functioning of a hotel and a motel. Hello, Motel, can I help you? Uh, $30 plus tax, $32.83. OK, sir, i see you later then. Bye-bye. I have a double and a single, a room with a double and a single, though. Is that OK? That's for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And when can you be here? Because I can only hold them to 4 o'clock, so. OK, for one person, it's 28, and for two people, 37 and above. It drives me crazy to watch all those cars. God, 
They make me nervous. Isn't the motel always on the main road? Yeah, you have to be on the main road, yeah. Terry, when did you open this motel? Eight years ago, December, we bought it. Yeah. You and Penny? Yes, we bought it together, yeah. How did you meet? Uh, in Mexico. She was sailing in Mexico with her husband and the two children, and uh, she stayed in my hotel in Mexico. You had a hotel in Mexico? Yeah, I had a kind of a uh, small, only 34 rooms, bungalows, little exclusive place for a tennis court. And she used to stay with me when they uh, came into port. And then later we, we became friends, and then I moved to Santa Fe in 1980. She divorced her husband, and then we decided to buy this place together. And she's a good maintenance. We can fix most maintenance problems ourselves. Rock screwdriver. Gotta go back. <laughs> Why did you leave Mexico? The government of Mexico expropriated at me. The top shots in Mexico City, they liked my land so much that they just took it all. Yeah, I got $32,000 for two homes that were over $120,000 worth. And then, of course, you know, between being put in jail six, seven times, but never being proven to be guilty, we got so fed up that my husband and I, we decided to leave. Just leave it all behind and start all over again. Is your husband here? No, we split. We separated it, yeah. 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 Why but were you they... put in jail? <coughs> As I say, they wanted to, to, uh, to break the spirit from a Dutchman. And that's not very easy to do. <laughs> we Dutch people, we don't give up. We really fought. I really fought it to keep my land. But it's the power of Mexico's politicians is so strong. You can't fight. Well, I met my husband in Mexico. And he was Mexican or American? American. From Kansas. We sailed in the South Pacific, where my daughter was born in Tahiti. And we sailed, we sailed about eight years. And then we had, I was, got pregnant again, so we decided it was time to Working or not. Time to settle down on land. So the Mexicans won. You gave in? They won, I gave in. Better than being shot at, you know. I mean, I'm still alive at least. Yeah, yeah, it's better than being shot. My, uh, my American husband, he couldn't take it. I went to jail for him twice because I know that if he would go to jail, he would just go berserk, you know. An American being in jail without being guilty in Mexico, it's. Who had the idea of opening a motel in Santa Fe? <laughs> it wasn't me, it was Terry. Penny's fixing 11. Just leave it. We are gonna fix some more. You are a freak this morning. Are they going in the office? In the office again. Yeah, the mate is doing your room, so... Right now, let me see if they left. She must have the key. Isn't it a bit difficult for three women to run a motel? Well, it's, it's, it's not easy, but I think I like the life because I can be with my kids. You know, I can always be home. Well, you've been very lucky. You haven't had any robberies. Oh, you should have Helen, Helen tell you about the robbery. We had a robbery, yeah. gunpoint robbery, yeah. But you have to have Helen tell it because it's really funny. <laughs> this is our one and only robbery at the Silver Saddle Motel. I came back from the movies, and Helen's lying on the couch, and I came in, and uh, I said, why, well, hey, the movies were really great. Are you enjoyed the movie? Yeah, I yeah? sure did. About this time, a young boy walks in the door. Can you change this? Sure. Well, there's nothing in there. <gasps> Helen! I hear his name, Helen, and I'm going up. Helen, he's got a gun. And I walk around, and I see this young man with a little gun, and I said, hey, what do you think you are doing, young punk? 
And I walked around and I kind of said, him, you know, and I said, hey, you think you can steal our money? And I grabbed his front shirt like this. He threw me over. I fall down. I see him take a box and I get up and I grab him by his leg and he fall out of the door. <laughs> That's the way it was. <laughs> he got away with one box, but the Coca-Cola box. Yeah, it had 33 cents in it, and the other one had $800. <laughs> and in the meantime, she runs away with $800. dollars <laughs> He got the wrong box. <laughs> but we tackled each other. <coughs> that was, that was, that was That's so it. I often wonder if that gun was loaded or not, you know? Really? See, one thing that she's deaf and she doesn't hear, and he actually Did cocked the gun. I heard it click. Did you have money in that and, box? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Here. Come here. Yeah. We don't want to have no a gun way. here. We don't want to no shoot anybody. No son of a bitch walk out of that door with our money. Never. Never, ever, ever. If you have a liquor store or I gas station, have a, have a gun. But, you know, we don't. there's no. not enough money around here to shoot somebody for. Or get shot for, right? But still, I wouldn't want them to walk out with money. Nothing yeah, but would you want to get shot for $500? I don't mind. $500? Nice way to go. Oh, well. If I go. Why aren't there any men here? Well, we're all divorced, that's why. <laughs> You're all divorced, all three of you? All three of us, yeah. Have been for many years. There's no time to even find a man when you're in this business. You work 24 hours a day. What, you know, who are you going to find? I mean, somebody comes over to visit and what? There's a whole bunch of people around, clients, kids, dogs, cats, other people. Well, it's real hard for me because I live in the manager's office and I don't have anywhere to get away. You know, I mean, somebody comes to visit me and all of a sudden everybody's there listening. You know, I don't have any, I can't no walk into a motel room with the... Somebody that no comes privacy. to visit. Yeah, I don't have any privacy. No privacy. No. This is hard work, you know. It's hard work? Oh, yeah, you have to fold it all up ahead. Oh, yes. You don't want to get married again? Oh, yeah, but I mean, not right now. <laughs> I mean, is it ever too late? I don't know. Yeah, well. I mean. Is it ever too late? Men are not, uh, I am not interested per se in men because my life is full as it is. I am interested uh, in philosophies. I read very good books. I go to my church. I have my family. We work very hard. Men is not, uh, not, uh, I'm not into it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Maybe later, I like to dress up and be pretty, basically for myself. I'm fulfilled into myself. I don't need per se somebody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first experience that Patty and I had with uh, a bunch of wild Indians from Cochiti Lake or from Ile de Defonso, that there were four guys in the room and we were not used to this kind of a rough, wild nature man. That's the way I call it, right? Yeah. Is it the nice way to say it? Yeah. But they had a nice truck and they all stayed in room number 12. And that year we have bought some red carpets from the Ramada Inn. The Ramada Inn was changing their rooms, so we were not so rich and we had to have a little better carpet. And then these Indians came and all of a sudden we hear a lot of movement going and a lot of shouting. So Penny and I, we, we run down in the middle of the motel and the door is wide open and I see those four big Indians and one is laying on the floor. And I looked at him and his whole hair was totally scalped, like, Somebody really scalped him like a, a, a white man would have done to an Indian. Remember that? And I was hysterical looking at all the blood flowing on my red carpet from the Ramada Inn. <laughs> Remember that? So Perry and I, we calmed everybody down and we told to one of the young men to turn the truck around. And we put kind of a sheet under him because he was so heavy. So. The four Indians plus two white women in one room, and one is bleeding to death with a scalp wound. I guess they got hit with and a bottle. Or yeah, he got hit with a bottle, and then he did. We all picked this big Indian. I mean, he was a fat one. We picked him up and kind of slushed him in the back of the truck, kept his head, and then they drove down to the hospital. I hope they never came back to see us because they were wild. That's it, man. Got the money back. I don't know why. Yesterday, we did the money, it was perfect, and now we got 60 too much. I don't know why you have too much money. Maybe it's my money. 
cash, we're saying the cash has a funny way of flying out the window and in the corner. And coming back again. And then it comes back. A couple of days. You yeah, know what it I mean? comes back. You could be it, it comes back. It comes too back. much, too little, too this, too that. Hey, your sixty dollars over. Hello? Good morning. Let me check it out. I'll be right there. Yeah, you better yes. sit down. I'm going to retreat. Yeah? Oh, I don't know. We don't have to go. We, I can make that seafood. Here, we don't have to go out to dinner. Huh? Okay, well. Come back, be home at 7 then. Yeah. Bye. Your daughter? Oh, my daughter's going to be home to help me, and you know. <laughs> Boyfriends are more important. You seem to have a regular family life here. Yeah. Just have a, you know, it's just a kind of a 24-hour-a-day interrupted family life, but, you know. She she does everything for me, really. I mean, cooks, and I help clean up sometimes, but not all the time. We bought the Silver Saddle Motel with the idea of staying here till all of our kids would be out of college. And that's what's happening now. And that's what's happening right now. Penny, what's the average weekly amount that you can make? Well, if, you know, it, that we could make if we were full all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, five, six thousand dollars a week. If we were full all the time, but you know, that's not the case, of course. That would be nice. Has there been a time where you thought, oh, it's never going to work? <laughs> yeah, like it. November, December, January, and February, when all you do is pay the bills. That's kind of the motel business. So you have off-season and on-season, and you save in the summer to pay your bills in the winter. It looks like it's been slept in. But the sheet to clean is nobody slept on it. Well, I don't know. Just what people do. They look at it and they mess up the covers. Then they come back and they say, we don't want it. Then they leave the covers unmet. You want your money back, you can. Could you just get us some clean sheets? We'll put them on ourselves. You want clean sheets? I'll give you some clean sheets. Yes, please. <laughs> That's what people do. You come here to my office. I'm going to give you a key. You're going to look if you dig it. You're going to mess up the bed. Then you come back. You don't fix it. You are not educated. Well, we are educated. Right or not? 99% are, so. are uneducated. Yeah, right. That's goddamn sure. I get mad. One afternoon, I was working here in a motel, and I had a young man that rented a room. And I knew the time he arrived. About an hour and a half to two hours later, this young man came to the office and wanted his money back. So Freddie and I, we went to check out the room, and he said he had not used the room. Well, we went, after two hours, we went down, and we saw a lot of semen on the sheets. So we told, hey, you want your money back after making love to this girl with semen on the sheets? Forget it, honey. But this young man made a scene. He actually wanted to win have a physical fight. So Freddie punched him out. <laughs> well, the young man lost his game. He never did give back his money. I mean, stuff like that goes down in a motel. No air conditioning? No, no this air get pretty condition. cool. Basically, you really do not know, uh, need air conditioning at yeah. night time. Well, that's... Because the difference in temperature during the day and at night is considerable. Yeah, I was Almost up here... Almost 30%. I was say. up here in January of... That's cold. So it was. And even know, then, it's not that cold. Yeah. I think the best temperature Santa Fe has, besides California, really. Yeah. You know, it never gets too hot and it never gets too cold. You take this, sign in. What do you want to do? So we're sitting here. 
and this wonderfully dressed gentleman walked in. And I thought he was going to have a room. The guy sat down, I introduced him to my boyfriend, and we started talking. Well, anyway, that night, he did not take a room. That's kind of surprised me. He informed himself about the prices. I guess he's going to take a room, beautifully dressed. It was winter time, and there was snow. The next evening, I was putting on the lights on the hall, in the hall, and I hear Helen, Helen. I turned around, and there was the same gentleman. His name was Ed. I said, he said, Helen, uh, I need a place uh, to sleep in my car. Uh, can I park somewhere here? I said, Jesus, Ed, you don't have any money to pay for a room? He emptied his pocket and had two dollars to his name. No more. I said, Jesus, you cannot sleep in your car in the winter time. Let me go talk to my sister. So I go talk to my sister. My sister said, Jesus, Helen, we can't let the, let the guy sleep in front of our house in his car. Why don't we invite him in and sleep in the living room? Well, we did. He slept in our living room and showered, got himself a job, etc., etc. Stay 14 days in our living room. <laughs> we felt sorry for him. Finally, he got a job in Albuquerque. So we were happy that he got a job and he moved to Albuquerque. Next thing, I'm reading the newspaper in the morning and the same guy with the same name shot dead by the police. He had fallen in love with the woman that worked at the Marriott Hotel in Albuquerque. He felt so much in love that he bothered her all the time. And I guess she didn't want to have anything to do with him. And at one point, he went berserk. He took a little gun that he had shown me already here. It was a beautiful gun and threatened the lady and then the security guard shot him dead. <laughs> so Eddie Boy was dead out of his misery. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> That's quite a story, isn't it? I mean, all this is in three weeks, you know. And so, Stella Motel, can I help you? Just a minute, let me You all seem to enjoy stuff. people a lot and have understanding for each other. You might say that we just make the best out of life. Wherever you are, you just have to go along with everybody and everything and enjoy life. You sit there getting mad because you don't like this, you don't like that, you don't like these people, you don't like those people. You might as well just give up and go to bed forever. Yeah. But you know, I do believe it is an advantage oh, it's, because it's you have been life. a sailor well, yeah. 12 years on the high seas uh, yeah, and we have traveled all over the world, so... You know, it makes a kind of a combination that fits together, true? You get angry, you have fights, but still you get together and you, you stick together. house at one time and they had beautiful women there was no rules or regulations and the law was the gun and the man that could shoot the fastest it's been run since at least 1939 the motel is open now to tourists it still looks very much the same it has been remodeled a little bit but it has no air conditioning and nothing fancy
Did you just get up? No, I just got up. Where did you sleep? Is that your motel room? Yeah. No, Mama's still sleeping. Do you ever sleep in motel? Very slow. Why not? Can't afford it. This is cheaper than the motel. Right. <laughs> no coffee, nothing to sleep there except for truck papers. Well, it's not the biggest sleeper in here. My wife and I are both little. <laughs> We've been forever. This is my motel room. Yeah, that's my home. I live in that about, oh, probably 300 days out of the year. I've done that for about 35 years. I got used to it and it don't bother me. to Los Angeles, where I had a business meeting, and the meeting went on forever. I missed two flights out of LA, and uh, I was exhausted when I finally arrived in Phoenix. I'd never been there before, and the map that the rental car people gave me was all wrong. So off I went through the desert by myself, trying to find Florence, Arizona. I was exhausted, and I kept going and going and going, and the roads were up and down all through the desert. It was just, it was a horrible experience. I didn't know where I was going. I was 2,000 miles away from home. And uh, just the sensation of turning this corner after coming 2,000 miles and seeing the blue mist motel, it was the most sinking feeling I've ever had in my life. <laughs> it was terrible. It's, it's the cheesiest place I've ever been. Um, so, uh, but it got better it, with each, you know, each time. How often do you visit your husband? Um, about once every six weeks. Was that the general plan? Well, yeah, that was the general plan, but I couldn't always get away. The first thing I ever heard about this motel was that there was this horrible um, murder here, and it, that's like the story that they tell everyone the first time they come to town and they find out you're staying in this motel. What was the story? Oh, uh, well, no, I probably am uh, not telling it completely correctly, but a guy broke out of the prison and his mother was staying here at this motel and he apparently hacked her up in, into little bitty pieces and tried to sell her to, like, the grocery store and, you know, it was just really gruesome and they said that the room where he did this, like there's supposedly still blood on the ceiling. And so they always ask you, what room are you staying in, you know? And of course, whatever room you say, they're gonna say, ooh, that's where it happened, you know? So the first night I spent in Florence, Arizona, I spent sleeping in the cheesiest motel I've ever slept in in my life, thinking that I was sleeping in the bed where a mass murder occurred. So, I mean, it was just, it's an experience that you just have to uh, live to believe strange place. <laughs> Daily procedure? Yeah. About 5, 5.30, get ready. 
gates open at 7.30 and you can go in and sign in and take your stuff in. And then the men are allowed to come out at 8 o'clock. That's when visits begin from 8 to 3 in this unit. Most of the women start staying in the motel because it's a lot easier than getting up at 3.30 in the morning from Phoenix. Does Mike have a special way he wants you to look? No, he just doesn't want to cut. <laughs> he, does, he says the red hair should be trimmed, maybe, but never cut. I always wore mine very short. Number one, I think that long hair on an older person looks borderline ridiculous. He doesn't seem to think so. <laughs> and he's boss. Does he ask you to wear certain dresses when you come to see him? Uh, the black blouse I had on yesterday in green. That's the only two requests. And no slacks, because he sees enough of those on the female guards over there. How many times a week can you see him? Two days a week. You can visit once a week. Saturday and Sunday, or Sunday and Monday, or Saturday and Monday. Seven hour visit. Unless it's a holiday. On a holiday, we can visit three days. That's only because he's minimum custody. Maximum custody and medium custody, they can only visit one day a week. Some units only two hours, one, one day a week. How much time will you have with him today? Two hours. Usually it's only 30 minutes, but, uh, since I'm coming over 1,200 miles away, Mr. Penn was very sweet and let me have, a, have two hours each visit. These little clear purses are called prison purses. Those are, that's the nickname for them because they need to be able to see through your purse. But we're allowed to take $10 in chain, package unopened, Cigarettes, it cannot be opened in any way. A package of gopher matches. They're not supposed to let me take Kleenex in, but I do because I don't like a runny nose. And my identification, and that is it. I gotta finish my hair. Sandra, how old is Bill? Bill's 36. What does he look like? Can you describe him to me? Five foot 10. Hazel eyes, dimple in his chin, dimple in his cheeks, probably weighs 200 pounds. He's a musician, he's an artist, he's funny. The family calls him the white Richard Pryor. He thinks he's Richard Pryor. So all of these things made you fall in love with him? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out. Helen, can you describe Mike to me? Um, six two, about um, 205 pounds, brown hair, dark brown hair, blue eyes, typically Irish all the way. That's one of the many things that we jived on. The only thing we don't jive on is the fact that I like to dance, and he said he would if he had to, but he didn't like to dance. But other than that, we, uh, I have a lot of similarities. I don't believe in hunting. I don't believe in worthless killing of animals or worthless killing of anything, for that matter. And he doesn't believe in it either. I'll have plenty to tell Michael. Nancy, what does Jason look like? He's, um, 5'10", 160 pounds. Gray hair, brown eyes, British. He's gorgeous. <laughs> He's gorgeous? Yeah, but I mean, would I be married to a slug? <laughs> How did you actually meet Bill? When I was a guard in that unit. In what unit? And the minimum custody unit. And I was what they call the operations officer in that unit. And he was one of the inmates in that unit. 
He's a lifer. Yes, he is a lifer. He's doing 25 to life. For what? For murder, first degree murder. It was a drug-related crime. The person he killed was a drug dealer, drug user. It was a drug deal that went sour. But how does a god get together with an inmate? How does that work? Yeah, how did that work? He was just there all the time. Of course, there were 500 other inmates, but uh, we got involved because we were involved in a lot of the same groups. We spent a lot of time together, and it just happened. How does anybody fall in love? I don't know, it just happened. Nobody was more shocked than me because I had a great career going with the Department of Corrections, believe me. I was uh, about to apply for my sergeant stripes. I had just uh, received Officer of the Month Award, which is a real nice privilege for a woman to even be in the running because we have to overcome so many things. And uh, I realized I was throwing all that away for somebody that uh, wasn't going to get out for a lot, a lot of years. He's not eligible for parole until uh, September 2001. Were a lot of your colleagues against what you were doing? A lot of my colleagues did not realize what was going on. There was some gossip, and that's when I quit the prison before it was discovered, before Bill got in trouble, and before I got fired, because I really loved my job, and I didn't want to leave there with a bad record. And the first day I got to come back and visit was after our wedding. Where did you meet Jason? At a tennis tournament in Boca Raton. He was playing in the tournament. He approached you? No, he um, asked a friend of mine uh, who I was and where I was staying, and he called and sent flowers and drove me crazy for two weeks. And finally he sent flowers? Every day. Yes. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Well, it's, it was just too much, but... Um, too many flowers? Yeah, it, my house looked like a funeral home. But it was nice, and uh, I thought that was special, so I went out with him and fell in love. And shortly thereafter, he was arrested and went to prison. Why was he arrested? He was arrested for a uh, credit card fraud. Uh, I was going to tell you how Mike and I met. It was through an article I wrote into the Houston Post, the Sound Off edition, where you can you know, get it out of your system. I had had a horrifying experience in my family. My niece's little two-year-old granddaughter was brutally beaten, burned, and murdered by her stepfather of five days. And to this day, this and this is three or four years ago. Uh, to this day, that individual, I won't call him a man, he's still walking free because uh, his case has been brought to trial. He has been, in, he's admitted to the murder, but it hadn't been brought to trial. His family put themselves in hock for $300,000. They got him out. And at the same time, there are people behind bars that don't belong there. To me, this, this is not justice. And I wrote in the sound up and said, you know, where is justice? Well, Mike read that in the post. And wrote me a letter. Of course, you put your address. And he agreed with me and went on to tell a little bit about his story. And it, it got me. Well, in Arizona, it was mistaken identity. He happened to be at the wrong place riding a Harley at the same time within blocks of where the robbery had taken place. He was given the same sentence for a robbery that men that are being put in there now are given for rape and murder, which is nauseating, to say the least. He was 19 or 20 when he supposedly committed the crime. And in Texas, he was protecting his own property, being ripped off by an illegal alien. He shot him in the leg. And in Texas, we have a 
real strict rule. If you shoot somebody on your property, you drag them over 50% inside your house and swear that that's where they were when you shot them. Otherwise, you're up for manslaughter. It's a ridiculous rule. So I answered Mike's letter. And that, that is the way our, our acquaintance began. I was married here. <laughs> you married and, here? I was married in the prison here in Florence. Why did you do that? Um, who knows? <laughs> uh, because I wanted to get married, or I had decided that I wanted to get married, and um, felt like he needed, um, he needed the feeling that our relationship had more stability than we were just lovers or living together. And uh, so I decided to get married. And since they wouldn't let him out, I had to go in. <laughs> it's just until you get used to the bizarreness of having a relationship with someone in prison, the thought of being married in a prison is just terribly far out. So, um, I mean, it took me a while, I guess, just to get used to the idea. But I guess, you know, once I got used to hanging out in prisons, it didn't seem so bad. <laughs> Hello. Hi. How was your visit? Great. Great. Yeah. Good birthday, good visit, good friends, good food. Surprised me with a big birthday cake. You mean Bill was able to arrange all this? Mm -hmm. Plus, um, he was arranged to have somebody out here buy me a birthday present. So it was very nice. What did he buy you? He bought me a pair of copper earrings, because he knows I collect earrings. Very unique. You fell in love with a very young man. Yes, I did. Um, uh, the ironic thing is the fact that he, he fell in love with me. That's the, that's the irony. We had corresponded for well over a year. And one day I got a letter from him. He said, I'm probably going to blow your mind with this. But he said, I discovered something. I'm in love with you. Does that make sense? I have done things for him that his family don't seem to think about. I write to him because I put myself in that position. If I were sitting in an eight by 10 place or however large it is, I would live for the mail guard to come by and bring me some kind of communication with the outside world. And I think that that compassion over the months and into years is what turned into love because he helped me the same way. Uh, right after I had my husband put in the nursing home with Alzheimer's, I had to go up to my brother's house and help nurse him until he died of cancer and stay on and try to take care of his wife and get her to, you know, ease her through it because I had been through uh, a death in a previous marriage. And lo and behold, she does. So through all of this, the one I could lean on, the one I could turn to was Mike, because he understood. Though he does not, his feeling for death is, uh, he can't cope with it. He can talk about other things to get my mind off of it. So, we've been good for one another. And it just, uh, like you say, it's strange. I'm almost twice his age. When you don't get to live with somebody you love, day in and day out, people who do have that luxury take it for granted. And when you can be this close to them, even that, you capture the moment. You can feel their presence. So it's almost like actually being together. You appreciate every little moment, even though you don't have the intimacy and you're not really together, you're not really alone. You're close. 
you're close. You get to really be close. Having stayed with a lot of ladies here, you know, they say a lot of crazy things. Let's, let's just go jump the fence. Let's go run down the canal bank. Let's just go break in, you know. And I have seen some ladies at certain frustrated points. I thought they were going to run out of here at 1 o'clock in the morning and try to break in. I wish I could figure out how to scale those six walls over there. <laughs> Does that tell you anything? I told him a while ago when I left over there, I said, well, if you can sneak out tonight, I'm in number three over at the motel. <laughs> I still have, you know, a thriving business and uh, have friends and a social life, but a platonic social life in Atlanta. Um, my life is the same, I just don't have sex. It, I don't know, it's um, a feeling that I have never had before, even through three marriages. I never had the, uh, you ask about the sexual standpoint, I never had that feeling of desire that I feel for Mike. And it will probably, may never be fulfilled. But I have a love for him like I've never had for anyone in my life. It just works with him, and it, it has never worked with anybody else. They used to have furloughs here. And now I don't know whether that was before the Patels had this place or not. I don't know. You know, that much history about uh, the Blue Mist. But this lady got her um, paranoid stepson out of prison on a weekend furlough. And when he didn't show up, they came over here and checked, and they found her body. But they didn't find him. The last I heard, <laughs> they still hadn't found him. <laughs> so uh, they did away with furloughs, darn it. <laughs> They were allowed to have a furlough here at the motel with their families until a particular incident happened. Like what? What happened? Like one of the inmates who was on furlough here in this room with his mother. In this room? In this room. Room 22. <laughs> on January 30th, 1984, a citizen here in the community, he used to work at the Arizona State Prison, which is just a little bit east of where we're standing right now, reported to us that a inmate known to him as Robert Mormon had been up to his restaurant acting very suspiciously and trying to get rid of what he called dog bones. We uh, started looking for Robert after we had a description of him. We came up to this room, room 22 here at the Blue Mist, and talked to Robert. My sergeant and another officer came and talked to him and he reported to us at that time that he was waiting for his mother to come home and she was off with some friends here in Florence. When we opened the room, with the search warrant we came in. It looked just like a motel room that was being lived in for the weekend. There was some new pots and pans laying here on the chair and on the floor. This bed here was disarrayed where Robert had been laying. This bed here, you could tell somebody had been laying on it, but it wasn't really disturbed. We found Maud's purse sitting on the nightstand between the two beds. We found her slippers on the floor near the window. We, at that time, were also advised that a lieutenant from the prison had been contacted by Mr. Mormon to, and asked to come to the motel room to pick up some dog bones to give to the dogs at the prison. From that, we asked to retrieve that box so that we could examine them. It uh, turned out to be Mrs. Mormon's lower extremities. She had taken her here into the bathroom and with a surrogated steak knife and a buck knife had completely dismantled her body. We were able to pick up points of blood in the floor where blood had dropped and splattered, which were photographed and picked up for evidence. In the bathtub itself, we were able to take the, the drain and we found pieces of human fatty tissue, which we were later determined that they did, in fact, they were Maud Mormon. We questioned Robert Mormon, and after two or three stories, he did finally tell us Yes, he had indeed killed his mother. And he had told us around town where he had deposited parts of her body. 
and Robert Mormon today is uh, on death row for the murder of his mother. Does one know why he did it? As far as I know, there are a lot of theories. Some said that she died of a heart attack. They felt she died of a heart attack. And he panicked, and he panicked, and he dismembered her. Uh, other people say they were sexually involved and in a fit of rage, you know. This was his adoptive mother. Yes, adoptive mother. Although he had, she had raised him. He was an infant when she adopted him. His name is Rob. His first name is Robert. His mother's name is Roberta. And, uh, but since that incident. No inmate, no more inmates come to the only motel in Florence anymore. You married a man in prison where most yeah. women would divorce men in prison. But I try not to think of him as a man in prison. Um, I try to think of him as the man he is. Uh, it's unfortunate that he is in prison, but it's not all there is to him. I mean, he's more than just a number for the state of Arizona. Um, he's a person, and he's a great person. So Mike has given you something that you really never had before. Right. In our visit, this trip out, I think kind of summed it up. He said, you're attractive. He said, it isn't your, your face, your beautiful hair that I fell in love with. I fell in love with your heart and with your personality. And I have that on tape. I told him he could never take that back because I have proof he said that. But he, ha he has given me something that has really been lacking uh, all my life. A feeling of somebody gives a damn. That, that I think, says it all together. You still feel like the cop and the convict? Yes. There's a lot of convicts who will never accept me because I'm still a cop as far as they're concerned. I was a cop, I'll always be a cop. There's a lot of cops who will not accept me because I joined the enemy. They teach about us in the academy. We have new officers come out and they tell us, oh, you're Bill and Sandy Doyle. Yeah, they talked about you guys in the academy. Do you know what they say? My maiden name was Irwin, and they say that Sandra Irwin was one of the best officers that came out of here. And she was manipulated, and she fell by the wayside, and if she could trade her badge in for a convict, anybody can. It can you can be manipulated by any convict. It's real frustrating. Well, you go in there, you're supposed to go in like a Marine. You're supposed to go in growling, and you're supposed to hate these idiots, you know, and they're all assholes. Your duty is to spread hate and discontent. That's your job. And unless you get called 80 names, derogatory names a day, you're not doing your job. You know, and after a while, the humanness and, and everything, it breaks, it comes through. It's real hard to be hateful every day for no reason. It's a real hard job. It really is. It's real hard to leave that place and go home at night.
Soak them up, plump and tender. They're sizzling and juicy when they hit the You thought your husband's idea was crazy. I sure did. He said, well, this would be a really good place to build a motel and have a large picture window and they could look out onto the screen and I said, oh, it would never work. That would just be the worst thing we could do. And he said, well, I'm gonna start building a motel. So there wasn't really much else I could do except go along with it. And as it turned out, it was really a good, it was a very good idea. We built the drive-in theater way back in 1955. We had a little three-room bedroom apartment uh, the wife and I, we had no children at that time. One night, my in-laws came to visit us. We gave them our bedroom, and we slept in the height of bed there. We saw the screen, but we didn't hear any sound, so I told the wife, I said, tomorrow morning, I'm going to put a speaker in here, and we can watch the movie while laying in bed. So that's how we uh, started there, and I told the wife, someday I'm going to build me a motel that we can sit down and watch, uh, watch the movie from your unit. be the last performance? Yes, it will. The last performance of the season. And then the season opens up again in October. I came here, you might say, as a last resort. The touring business was kind of dying out for the solo performer. When I found 
myself confronted with this empty hotel and theater that no one wanted, I somehow had the feeling that I was looking at the other half of my life. I was so intrigued with it, I told my husband about it, and together we both realized we were looking at our future. It seems to me that this is actually a motel here. Well, it's called a hotel because it was built at a time, 1922, when there was no such thing as a motel. It was considered a hotel. There were no motels. People didn't even know the meaning of the word motel back in 1922. There's something more permanent about the word hotel than motel. It has more class to it, too. neglected for so many years that uh, the maintenance for it has dwindled to a point where the water and sewer systems are defunct. It needs a new roof. If a new roof isn't put on it, it's going to deteriorate to a point where there is no shell, no building. And it can hardly be supported by a dancer's performances in the opera house. I mean, to support a whole hotel and a ghost town is a very difficult financial task. We're restoring the motel, but we hope to find somebody to come out here to operate it for us so that we can take care of the opera house and just let them run the hotel, motel, whatever. There's just Marta and myself living here in the town, and she takes care of the theatrical part of it, and I do too to some degree, but then I also have to go out and take care of the town itself. This is a ghost town. A town that has only two to four people living in it is considered a ghost town. I've known Marta ever since she's been here, and one day I come walking in, and you, when she first started painting the mural and asked her what she was doing. She said, oh, I'm going to paint these walls all the way around and the ceiling too. And I said, uh, holy mackerel, are you going to do all that? And I just shook my head like I didn't believe her. But I come back a, a few months later and sure enough, she was right in the middle of it. I have an obsession of painting on blank walls. Wherever I've lived, I've done it. 
And these walls, of course, dictated to me an audience because it was my theater, it was my make-believe opera house, so I could make out of it anything I wish through my painting. But these were your only audiences for quite a while. Yes, many, many, many evenings. All I had was my painted audience, and my painted audience grew as the years went by. And as it grew, the real audiences grew, too. I think that when I painted the mural, it were some of the most tragic years of my life. But I wouldn't believe it, because I had a mural to finish. She, um, she was going through, what I would say, um, marriage problems. Uh, she had a husband with a, a superego that wanted uh, all of her time, and she wanted to spend her time as an artist and painting and uh, doing things here in the opera house and on the stage. And uh, so she, her own time was taken up quite a bit. She was, didn't want to be a, just a standard housewife. I was in here all the time, working, practicing, painting, sewing costumes. We were married, and I was a wife, and wives just don't, that's not expected. They're supposed to cook a nice dinner and be available for anything the husband wants. And suddenly the title of wife terrified me. It meant obligations, it meant obedience, it meant, uh, you know, stop what you're doing to please someone else if it's necessary, which is something I never had to do. Even with my mother, I didn't have to do that. I could paint into the wee hours of the morning or work on my dances all day long, and she just reveled in it. But as my marriage went on, my husband did not revel in that. It irritated him. I was obsessed with my theater, and I thought, this is the first time in my life I had the world that I wanted, and I created it. And somehow, I guess he felt left out. He told me he felt left out. Was he left out? I think that was his imagination. Is your husband Tom's portrait on these walls? No. A lot of people thought the king and queen were Tom and me, but I don't think they look like us at all. Some people think that Siegfried looks like Tom. Siegfried? Siegfried. What part of Siegfried looks like Tom? The beard and the, the width. He has a broadness, a strength, a physical bigness. Tom has gotten big through the years. Uh, I felt very guilty when I was told that I left him out, and that guilt began to show in my performances. He caused a lot of heartaches and problems for her in the way he treated her. He hated me, and he tried to destroy me. We had one phone here, and I would lift the phone to make a call, and I'd always hear his voice talking to his lady friend. Always, as if he had a recording, just to hurt me. My marriage was falling apart, and I thought to myself, well, there is no better person to ask for advice how to hold your marriage together than a madam. They seem to know all the, the slants of it. So I dressed up and got in my little car, and I drove north seven miles, and it was broad noonday, and I rapped on the door of the house of ill repute, the door opened, and this very tough-looking, red-headed woman standing there with a baby doll on, and you could see everything through it. She says, what do you want, honey? And I said, well, I, I am Martha Beckett from the Amargosa Opera House, seven miles south of you, you know? She says, oh, yeah, yeah, of course I heard of you. And I said, well, I've come to see Crystal. She's the madam, and I've come to see her for advice because my marriage is falling apart, and I thought she might be able to give me a few pointers. Oh, come in, honey, come on in. She invited me into this dark room where there was a little fountain in the middle and a light shining up on it. Fountain of a nude woman with water falling all over her. And there were some very shady pictures on the walls. And she says, come on into the kitchen and we'll have a cup of coffee. And so she sat down, was very confidential, and she leaned forward. And she listened to all my problems, and she says, you know, honey, I wish that Crystal could help you, but she's not here now. And you know why she's not here? She's out over in Las Vegas because she's getting a divorce. I have had the same experience with previous marriages, and I thought maybe that I could uh, talk to her and maybe I could help her. 
You mean you had that ego problem too with your wives? No, no. <laughs> no, I didn't have a have an ego problem. I just uh, my first wife, um, she's the one that decided to go out and mess around. Okay, and I couldn't take this, so I we divorced, and I also had four children by her, and it was being pushed away from the children and not being able to ra help raise them and see them, that's what tore me up. And then the second wife uh, that I had, she had two children, so I helped raise those two children, but then after the children got raised, uh, she wanted to go out and try the field again, and so again I had the same problem, which was I could not take it being, uh, I, I didn't figure, feel a marriage should run that way. So I finally uh, just left that one too. I approached Wilgett one day and I said, would you rehearse the lights and the curtain with me? Because my husband is going to leave and there's going to be a time when I won't have any stage manager or anyone to help pull the curtain or do the lights or an MC. So please, see, maybe you, we could rehearse together and keep the show going because He's going to leave in January, which is right in the middle of our season. And uh, he said, sure, I'll try. So he did. And he was very good with the lights and the curtain. Excellent. I could see that he had the potential to perform, but he just didn't ever tap it. He was a comedian. All over town, he was a comedian. He had a three-wheeler and used to ride on the three-wheeler, leaning backwards, almost doing a back bend and uh, putting his legs up on the handlebars, and he'd ride along like that at great speed, and his red hair flying in the wind, saying, ar, 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 ar. And I thought, you know, what a waste. This, this guy really has um, comedy in him. I called my mother up a couple of days ago, and she said, you know, it's always been there, but you're just a late bloomer, that's all. <laughs> that's all, I guess I'm just a late bloomer. Wilgett became the replacement of your husband. Oh, more than that, <laughs> yes. So there's a love there. There is a love. Our worlds were completely opposite from where we came, completely opposite. He understands my need to be alone with my art. He sometimes doesn't understand everything that I create. But for the theater, he seems to understand it, and he falls right into rehearsal, and I can tell him what to do and mold him just like clay, and then he takes it on from there and creates his own character. But why do two people who love each other have to agree on everything? You know, that's, that's silly. Marta fucked me and changed my whole life by putting me in the front of the public's eye and putting me on stage, doing things that I didn't know I was capable of doing. And now she has given me something that I wouldn't mind doing the rest of my life. I'm thankful that from the day I was three years old, I realized I wanted to dance and I wanted to paint, and I have never given that love up. So many people live their whole lives without even knowing what that fanaticism is, and to me that's very sad. And that fanaticism can either lead to a very lonely life it can lead to fame and fortune. It can lead to all kinds of things, but it's the end in itself that's important. You had a mother that shared your fanaticism. She went everywhere and sat in the dressing room, and I was her little moneymaker. Some mothers seem to have a fetish about money. They idolize it. I had my debut in the Bronx at a little nightclub called the Hula Hut. And of course, Mother was there, and I'll never forget it. That was my debut. Was she happy for you? Well, it was, no. Uh, she was happy to have the money. Uh, I performed in a lot of these little places, in and around the Bronx and Brooklyn. And uh, I remember payday. We'd all stand in line at the paymaster's office and receive these little envelopes of cash, 
and mother's arm would be first reaching up to get it. So she really she, used you? Well, she, she managed my finances. She called them our finances. And uh, she claimed that we were too against the world. And uh, almost like she was trying to make a pair of twins out of us. I will work and make the money, and she will know how to invest it. And she did not invest it wisely. She gambled in the stock market and lost it. One of the things she used to say over and over again, oh, you will climb up the ladder to success, and mother and you will cross the country back and forth, and you will be a success, and I will ride right along with you. And of course, this used to bug me. It was a burden to me. I constantly felt this is what she expected. And as I grew older and got on Broadway and got into shows and my career expanded, I found there was no room for mother. And I began to feel guilty about that because she just expected there would be a place for her in my life for as long as we both lived. You were her life. Oh, she told me that I was her breath and life. And uh, she assumed I would never marry, I would never have any boyfriends. I would, she didn't even like it when I had girlfriends in the ballet. I used to have a lot of close friends, and we'd talk about things, of course, that I couldn't talk about with mother. And um, Did you love her? Yes, and I still love her. I still love her. She, she was a burden, but uh, you see, her divorce was... I. I my father married her best friend, and somehow I felt she was betrayed, and I was sort of led to believe that I could make up for that loss if I tried real hard, and I did try real hard. But uh, I could not change myself into someone else, and that's, I think, what she wanted. But she did love my art. She loved what I wanted to do with my life, and she was the only one in my life who approved of my art, so how could I help but not love my mother? Oh, Mama, I've always loved you. You know that. I'm, I know I've been a big disappointment to you, but I'm going to make it up somehow. I know that you and Grandma have big ideas for me. You all dreamed about my becoming a classical prima ballerina. You worked hard to put me through Miss Witherspoon's Dancing Academy. After I graduated, I went to Vladimir Uspensky's Ballet School in New York and somehow got mixed up with all the wrong people. I was convinced by all my friends I was too pretty to suffer for art. I was convinced that a career as a classical ballerina would never pay off. Then I got a job at the Razzmatazz nightclub, and suddenly I found myself on Easy Street. I'm now a woman of the world. I'm Crystal LaRue, and I'm going to open the old Hurley Burley Saloon and provide all the entertainment myself by dancing the parts of my sisters, Tilly LaRue, Carmen LaRue, and Fanny LaRue. I'm aware constantly of time. I'm aware of the fact that you cannot borrow it, you cannot beg for it, you cannot save it. It fleets by, uh, and it's gone. I've used a lot of time struggling, finding my way out here, and finally over half my life is lived, and I have all of a sudden this marvelous place, but I still don't have enough time. I have the place, but I don't think I'll ever have enough time, and that's what saddens me. Sometimes I wish I could live forever. When I came here, I didn't own anything but a car and some furniture. But now the, I've been here for five years, and uh, in that five years' time, I've inherited a whole town, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, a whole town, a beautiful woman, an artist. I mean, you're a lucky man. 
You well, feel lucky? Well, when you look at it that way, I do feel myself lucky. Uh, I, I look back on my life, and I look back on what I was doing before I came here, and um, this is uh, really the happiest time of my life because uh, my life now is so varied, you know, and I'm busy, but I'm not over busy to where I, I, I don't get bored anymore. I don't have time to get bored. And you're with a woman you love? Yes, I'm with a woman I love. But I never thought I would have a woman with the character and talents of Marta Beckett and her dancing and painting would feel the same way about me, you know. But it just turned out that way, and I'm lucky. Tomorrow evening, don't miss Howard Hawk's classic western, Red River. John Wayne and Montgomery Clift in his film debut, considered by many the greatest western of all time. Red River, tomorrow at 10 on Channel 2. Quintessential monster movie, King Kong, at 10 past midnight. Stay with us now, Bill Moyers next, News at 11. Jim Cartwright's Road on a Live from Off Center at 11.30. Stay tuned. <laughs>